What's up guys? I'm back with the full review for the Audio Control Maestro M5. So I've spent the last few weeks with the M5 in my home theater. If you guys are unaware, this is a surround sound processor. If you don't know what a processor does, I'll leave a link for our video describing what they are in the description down below. But in a nutshell, this is basically a receiver minus the built-in amplifiers. Anyways, I did watch a plethora of movies with my time with it. As you know, we do movie reviews here too, so having a preamp processor that performs flawlessly is important when we discuss the audio portion of the movie reviews. You want clean dynamics, accurate surround decoding, and you want to be able to navigate it without any operational bugs. Now for testing, I've got this hooked up in my dedicated home theater. I'll be using the Rotel 15 series amplifiers, powering a 7.1.4 Arendelle sound speaker setup with SVS subwoofers handling all subwoofer duties. If you guys haven't heard of the Arendelle sound THX speakers, I'll leave a link for the review at the end of this video. As for sources, I've got a Panasonic UB9000 hooked up to a Sony 695 ES projector. Now that we got that out of the way, if you guys missed the unboxing video, we'll go ahead and just rerun that video again. But before we jump into it, if you're into this addictive home theater hobby and love movies, then tap the subscribe button for new weekly videos. All right, let's roll the video. Inside, you get the owner's manual, the power cord, the remote control and batteries, a calibration mic for direct live room correction, along with a USB cable, and last but not least, the antenna. So this is Audio Control's second highest end processor and their more affordable one. It retails for $5,900 and it's only available through the custom install market. It's Dolby Vision capable, supports Dolby Atmos, DTSX, and IMAX enhanced audio formats. It measures your standard 17 inches wide by 16 and a half inches deep by seven inches high, and it weighs 23.9 pounds. Taking a look up front, we have buttons for menu, input selection, a select button, and an info button. There's also a 3.5mm headphone jack next to a 3.5mm auxiliary input. For six grand, I would have liked to have seen a quarter inch headphone jack instead of the 3.5mm one. On the other side, we have buttons for mute, surround mode, direct, display, zone selection, and the volume knob. Around back are 7 HDMI 2.08 inputs with 3 HDMI outputs with one supporting ARC. There are 6 RCA inputs with 4 coax and 2 optical ins. There's also a pair of balanced XLR inputs. Here are some unbalanced RCA preouts as well as balanced XLR outputs for all 11 channels. Although if you're running two subwoofers, the second subwoofer is RCA only. Here we have more connections for triggers, an RS-232 in, FM antenna, USB in, and an Ethernet input. There's also a main power switch back here. Okay, let's take a quick peek at the M5 settings. If you're familiar at all with processors, you might see a striking resemblance to this menu. The audio control as well as the newer Lexicon Pre Pros are based off the Arcam platform. And yes, I know the user interface looks like it was from the 80s, but it's not about the UI, it's what it can do. Under Input Configuration, this lets you select each input's default settings. You can rename the input like I have here. Adjust Lip Sync Delay. Here you can choose the last audio mode you use to be reapplied the next time you go back to the input. This mode is the default mode after you've powered it back on, after turning it off, and you have your bass and treble controls. Room EQ is your direct live setting which you can turn on and off. For stereo mode, you can have your left and right speakers have full range response, run them full range with a sub, or running your left and right small with bass to the subwoofer. Sub stereo is the subwoofer's level in stereo mode. Audio source lets you specify HDMI or analog for the input, and CD direct is only if your source outputs PCM. Next is general setup. I'm not playing anything, so some of the info is grayed out, but this will show you what your incoming source looks like, and if you want to apply compression to Dolby and DTS formats. Center spread will send some of the center channel info to your left and right speakers to give you a wider center image. Digital out will upscale your analog source's audio. Max volume sets your maximum volume level. This could be handy if you got little ones messing around with your volume control. 
Max on volume is the default volume when you turn on the M5. Display time turns off the LED display at a specific time. CEC and HDMI audio is kind of easy to figure out. Control lets you control the unit with either RS-232 or through IP. Standby mode lets you control the M5 while it's off over IP, and it'll let you pass video through it when it's off too. For speaker types, this is all basic stuff. You know, small or large, and you can tell the system if you have certain speakers in your setup. And here you have your speaker distances. This is done in milliseconds after you've run room correction. You can actually change this here if you know what you're doing. Here are the speaker levels. Video inputs lets you choose what input goes where. Here you can turn on or off the on-screen display overlay. HDMI 1080p will let you upscale HD resolution or let you bypass it without any upscaling. For mode, you can choose whether or not you want these formats active. You do have to keep these turned on for Atmos and DTSX to work properly. I turned off a couple of them and I couldn't figure out why Atmos wasn't working. Come to find, all these had to be set to yes. And then you get your zone settings and your network info, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, the settings are very basic. It's quick to navigate and it's easy to understand. Alright, I think one of the main selling points of the M5 is the inclusion of direct room correction. If you're in a home theater, you might be familiar with Odyssey. Think that, just on steroids. There are two ways you can use it to take measurements. You can download the Android or iOS app, or you can use the PC software, which you can download straight from their website. I ended up using my laptop paired with a UMic 1 USB microphone. The software corrects impulse response, which will improve clarity and the spatial aspects of the sound. It also corrects for frequency response by addressing time domain problems. When you first load up the program, you'll have to choose your device, then choose your microphone. Next, you'll measure each speaker level, so be sure you start off placing the mic at the main listening position. You want to be sure you're within the green area here. Next, you're going to choose your seating arrangement. If it's just for one person, choose chair. If it's for a larger area, pick sofa. Here you can measure up to 17 points. You want to be sure the microphone is placed at the main listening position before starting. After your first sweep, you want to keep the microphone between 15 to 24 inches from the last spot. You can do fewer than 17 positions, but the rack recommends you do the full 17 for the best results. This took me about 30 minutes for all 11 speakers. When you're done, you'll end up with a graph with before and after results. You can stay with the rack's targeted curve or you can adjust the curve to your taste. You can adjust them speaker by speaker or as a group. When the program is done designing your filter, just click export and it'll send the file over to the M5. Once it gets copied over, you can either go into the settings and select it under EQ, or you can manually select it using the remote. So now when watching a movie, you can do a quick A and B comparison on how it sounds with or without room correction. I queued up some of my go-to scenes that I use for every one of these pre-pro reviews. Just to test out how this does for bass, I put on chapter 1 of Blade Runner 2049. For my subwoofer, I use a PB16 in the back of my home theater. Even without any room correction applied, the opening scene will just rumble the hell out of your eardrums, which isn't a bad thing. But if you take the time to do a comparison with correction on and off, at least for me, I could tell bass was a lot less boomier, especially in seats where there was an overemphasis in the lower region. It was smoother and tighter overall, especially when the bass just hits and just trails off during the beginning of the chapter. Now if you've got more than one subwoofer, this particular version of Dirac only applies correction to a single subwoofer. So despite there being two subwoofer outputs, it'll treat it as one. And if you have a less than ideal room, and you have an issue like a dead spot or a null, then no amount of room correction can fix that. Having room correction, no matter how good it is, can't fix everything. So the next clip I listened to is one of the best movies ever made, Power Rangers. The opening of this movie starts off with a ship flying from the back speakers and slowly rumbles overhead in the height speakers and just disappears in the front channels. There is really good integration with not only bass with my front speakers, but some really good spatial localization as the ship creeps up from behind your head. The Integra processor, which I owned, was one of my favorites. I had a harder time telling there was something coming from the back speakers because everything seemed more muddled sounding on that Integra. So getting that clean distinction in sound wasn't there with the Integra and to a lesser degree the Marantz 8805 when I had that in for review. With the audio control I got that extra sense of space in my room with really good localizable sound effects. Being able to hear that ship coming in the back or hearing the little pieces of rubble falling on the floor was something I've heard many times before, but this time with much more clarity and accuracy. There's also another scene where the boys try to make their escape from the cops. 
as they drive down the street, you can see the camera pans around the interior of the car. You can clearly make out the sound effects when they circle around to each one of the lower channels. When I was sitting dead center in the money seat, I got that almost binaural in my head effect. If you listen for it, you can hear that cow mooing all around your head. Surround decoding and sound movement, two thumbs up. Another one of my favorite movies I always reference is A Quiet Place. I'm always listening for the slight ambiance and how much bigger a processor can make my room feel. I think the thing you'll notice here is how quiet the noise floor is. I didn't hear any kind of hissing or buzzing, so that's always a good thing. And of course, it's dependent on how quiet your amplifiers are too. But again, this does give you that pinpoint sound placement in space. You can hear the raccoons running right above your head after the kids drop that lamp. It can be heard coming from the left front height speaker right over to the right front height speaker. It was perfectly audible. The way it can render ambiance like wind and other environmental effects that throw your speakers outwards and upwards was done amazingly well. This is going to be a short list. Dolby Atmos in DTS-X is a given, and so is pass-through of all the HDR formats. It's got IMAX enhanced support and internet radio, and that's pretty much it. If there's one thing that I really wanted is a dedicated app for my iPad. I mean, there's one for Arcam and there's one for Lexicon, so why not one for audio control? They're all basically the same thing, right? I know what you're thinking though. You can buy a $300 receiver with AirPlay, voice control, app support, Sonos, Heos, etc, etc. That's all good and dandy, but it's still missing the one most important feature, amazing sound. I think you know how I feel about the M5. I think it's an amazing piece of gear, but it does come at a hefty price. When you have competitors like Emotiva dropping processors for almost $1,000 cheaper, with options for upgradability and future proofing, the $5,900 asking price might be hard to justify. One thing that should give you peace of mind if you decide to go with the M5 is a polished, dependable user experience that's been faultless in its performance. It didn't give me any lockups, freezes, popping, or sluggishness. It just works, and it works well. It lacks a lot of the bells and whistles of the other bigger, more well-known brands, but what it brings to the table is a level of surround sound clarity and refinement you just won't get with the other guys. Who cares about bells and whistles? It's all about the sound. Having direct live room correction on board is a big bonus, and it's only found on the best products out there. If I had to compare it to another processor that sounded equally as good, it'd have to be the NAD M17 V2. That pre-pro is very much like the Emotiva RMC1 as it is upgradable. But just like upgrading a computer, you tend to run into little bugs and problems that can make it frustrating to use. That's why the NAD didn't find a permanent home in my rack. Being future-proof was one thing, but being reliable was more important, which makes the Audio Control M5 my new go-to processor. It was the best sounding processor I've had in my home theater, and it's reliable. Are there better sounding options out there? Yeah, I'm sure there are, but I haven't had them in here for review yet. Well, alright guys, I think that's a wrap. I'd normally say if you want to pick up this processor, I'll leave a link for it down below. But this can only be purchased through the custom install market, so I guess you'll have to call your local hi-fi shop if you want to pick it up. Now these are just my thoughts on the M5. If you've ever heard one, let me know in the comments what you think about it, and what are the upgrades you're planning for your home theater. As always, thanks for watching. You can find us on social media, links down below. And if you want to support the channel and help us keep these videos going, then stop by our Patreon page. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys again in the next video.